You are listening to the Revolutionary Love and Resilience Podcast. I'm Shelby Lee, and I am so honored to be here with you today. This podcast bridges the personal and professional, creating space for experts in the wellness and well being field to be both vulnerable and share their deep wisdom from their years of experience. This podcast weaves trauma awareness, inclusivity, and inspiration for every single person to be able to heal, grow, and become who they want to be, to step into their full authenticity and expand their capacity to claim their best lives as they journey through challenges towards revolutionary love and resilience. Uh, So we're here with Myra Holtzman for the Revolutionary Love and Resilience podcast. Oh my goodness. Myra, thank you so much for being here. I feel a little bit enamored with you. I feel (laughs) excited to be cultivating this new uh, friendship and colleagueship. I met Myra in this incredible training that she's already fully been through and I'm just diving into the Somatic Regulation and Resilience Training with uh, Kathy Kane and Stephen Terrell. And for the, from the first moment we met, you felt like a person who was safe. And I don't use that lightly. Um, I felt, I usually all worked up in trainings with all my defenses and layers of uh, protection around me. And I felt like here is a person who is real. Here is a person who has done her work and who's willing to be brave and vulnerable. And through that, I felt really held by oh. the way you held yourself. And so this conversation is, I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you yeah. for being here. Absolutely. Me too. You're, you're making me tearful right off the bat. Because um, what I remember about that first interaction is feeling like, one, I was taking a risk and sharing what I shared. And then two, feeling also like really trusting that it was going to be okay, that it was going to be safe for me to be really fully expressed about the story and um, that I wasn't going to be judged, which is, you know, you know, it's a thing. It's hard to feel safe if you think you're going to be judged. So I'm thrilled to be here. So thank you for asking me. Mm, you're welcome. <laughs> so I'm going to let people know, I'm going to read a bit about you out loud to everyone, just so they can start to get a sense of where you're coming from and who you are. And then after that, we're going to dive into your story and, um, and why it is that you do what you do and your experience of revolutionary love and resilience. Great. So Myra is a longtime personal empowerment catalyst and self-help junkie. After undergrad, she led mountaineering courses in Colorado, California, and South Africa for participants ages 15 to 65, and from there went on to complete graduate school in social work. Myra is a somatically trained psychotherapist devoted to healing trauma and attachment wounding. After being in solo private practice in Denver, Colorado for the last three years, she has decided to expand and created a group of a group psychotherapy practice devoted to bringing somatic approaches to healing. Her new practice set to open February 1st, 2020 is called Somatic Therapy Partners. Oh, I'm so excited for this. (laughs) When she isn't deep diving into her own healing work and work with clients and pursuing further education in the resolution of trauma, she is dancing adventuring with her amazing family and pursuing pleasure through being a total foodie. (laughs) (laughs) So welcome, Myra. Is there anything that you feel moved to share on top of that, that you want us to know about you? No, I think that's a, I think that's a pretty good overview until we start digging in a little bit more. I sort of chuckled at the end because um, food is like one of the greatest pleasures of my life. Like when my husband first met me, one of the things he said was like, I've never met anyone who thinks about food as much as you and um, will think about meals way in advance before you get there. And I'm like, well, yeah, isn't it tantalizing to think about like the yummy food you're going to eat? So anyways, I was just laughing that (laughs) I decided to include that in my bio because it's really a thing for me. I love food. I love amazing food. I love interesting food. So that's all. I love that because we know that resilience is part of resilience is pleasure. 
Absolutely. It sounds like that's a real resource for you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think we would have fun thinking about food together. (laughs) (laughs) I think so too. Yeah. Oh, well, I'd love to just jump right in and hear about how you might define revolutionary love and resilience and how the lack of that had maybe contributed to it growing in your life. If you have a story from your past that feels Mm. that it just elicits that for you where it wasn't and how it's there now. Yeah. Um, Well, let me answer the first question of how I might define, because I think it's a great question to ask how you define revolutionary love and resilience. And the thing that came up for me um, in terms of both of those things um, is for me, it's unshakable faith in myself to weather the storms and get through the things that are hard as well as the things that are glorious. I think that sort of covers both of the definitions. That unshakable faith, um, I just have such like true, authentic, genuine faith in my ability and capacity, even for the things that I don't know. Like I trust that I'll be able to figure those things out or find a way to get through the hard parts because there have been many hard parts in my life as I think that's true for a lot of people. Um, And the other way that I would define revolutionary love, which, you know, I get a lot of feedback from the people around me, both from clients as well as like friends and family But one of the ways that I express revolutionary love is I'm pretty open about how much I love myself. And not from that like egotistical way, like I'm better than you, I'm, you know, it's not anything that there's, this isn't about power. It's about like, no, I really love myself so much, for example, that I would not allow someone to treat me badly. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, boundaries is a big thing in being a therapist, teaching clients how to have boundaries and having really good boundaries. And I just feel really clear that I'm going to be one of the best advocates and lovers of myself more than anybody else on the planet. And I just don't think that people have that map or way of being. So here's just a quick story about that. So when I was dating my husband, he um, came to pick me up for our first date. And, you know, I opened the door and I'm all dressed to the nines, whatever. And he's like, wow, you look great. And I was like, I know, right? (laughs) And his response, which is a response I get from, you know, some people was like, his thought was like, God, who the hell does this woman think she is? He thought I was being really egotistical. Um, And it really wasn't about that. It wasn't about the image. It was just like, yeah, I put effort into my outfit. I take care of myself. I feel joyful and ready to go. Yeah, I do look great. And more more than anything else, like I feel really good in myself, just being who I am. And while that has evolved over time, that to me is like one of the biggest acts of revolutionary love is how deeply you can love yourself and express that to the people around you. Because what I have found is that people really like to be around that. It's joyful. It's loving. For me anyways, it's playful. It's delightful. Um, And I want other people to have access to that because it's so generative and, and resourceful. And then that leads us to like greater resilience, right? When we've got that inner capacity for greater and greater resource and access to that, you can just bounce back from things. It's pretty amazing. It's Mm -hmm. revolutionary. So It is absolutely revolutionary. It's not something we are taught and we have to go against a lot to learn Mm -hmm. it, express it and live as that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And then the, I do have a story, but it's more of like just sort of a time in my life um, that sort of illustrates this. So um, I'm Filipina and in my late 20s through uh, for 10 years, I was an outward bound instructor. So I was a mountaineering instructor in California. You read all of this in the bio. Um, And I was I was in my training program before I became an instructor. I was one of three people of color in a group of 35 or 40 new instructors. And I really felt that. (laughs) Like I really felt the sting of being not just a person of color, but a woman of color in a predominantly white male. Um, And this was back in the, um, you know, 90s, early 2000s. Um, But I was one of few people. And I, I remember at that training, I had four different people who were also in the training ask me about my resume. 
like, meaning like, you know, how hard have you climbed? What big peaks have you climbed? Have you ever been on an expedition? And I was pretty sure that nobody else was asking that in the ways that it was getting asked. And um, my, my story about that is that, that those 10 years of being a mountaineering instructor for Outward Bound really helped me cut my teeth because I, was, I really felt like I was on proving grounds. And then by the time I left, I felt pretty clear that I was over proving myself to anybody about anything. And I had a really stellar record um, as a as an instructor, like leading really great courses, taking clients, taking students on really technical peaks. You know, um, I wasn't so focused on the numbers because I, you know, I climbed as hard as I could, but it wasn't, you know, I wasn't climbing like I don't know the pros or whatever. And that whole time in my life, I think, is what was a huge platform for me to reach that place of self-love and resilience because I was like, well, if I can get through that and if I can keep people safe on in really dicey terrain, like really dangerous terrain, I mean, you know, nature doesn't have an agenda. It just does whatever. Um, then I can pretty much do anything I set my mind to. And fortunately that has served me for the whole of my life after out and bound. Oh, wow. Yeah really aware of, you know, the words you use, which is I really learned how to prove myself or I felt like I had to prove myself. Yeah. And I had so many mixed feelings come up as you shared that. <laughs> it just felt kind of icky, you know? Yeah, it's icky. Yeah. And that the way that they were asking, it just felt like this condescending kind of questioning experience that feels so uh, misattuned. Yeah. And I feel a lot yeah. of sadness hearing that you would have to feel like you were proving yourself. Well, and it happened throughout my entire career. So, you know, after a few years, I was, I was a chief instructor or a lead instructor. And um, whether it was running the whole course and overseeing other, other of the instructors or running a course with a male counterpart, because they like to try and, you know, pair males and females together. And watching students go to my male counterpart for all of the technical questions and all of the, what are we going to do tomorrow? And what's going to be the route? And, you know, things like that. And I was like, okay, like I'm the senior instructor here, but that's cool. <laughs> but it was, a, it was such a consistent thing. Um, I remember one particular situation where we were going down a really um, steep coulard. And so this coulard was... I don't know what the angle is, but it was pretty steep. It had a lot of loose rocks. We had to set up ropes and everything like that. So, you know, and it took like, it was an all day kind of thing to get from point A to point B. And the coulard was the, the um, apex of uh, danger. And at the end of the day, as we were all processing with the students, one of the, one of the male students was just like, and thank God for Jameson for helping us get down. La, la, la. And I was just like, I set up all that. Like I set up all the ropes, all the anchors. I was the one that traveled up and down the coulard. You know, like it was so Ugh. astounding to me. You know what I mean? Like it was like, okay, I guess that's just how it is. Wow. Things I mean, like that. Does the word invisibility resonate with you when you say that? On so many levels, I can't even tell you. Ugh. On so many levels. I can't even begin to tell you. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, it just makes me so curious. I heard you say, like, it's cool, this kind of coping mechanism. But, I mean, how did you really get through that? Um, that's a great question. How did I really get through those things? You know, the first thing that comes to mind is, like, well, I really know what happened. I mean, I think this was the building of the unshakable faith in myself. Um, I really know what happened, and I really know that within the within my um, co instructors that I was working with, I was getting a lot of care, credit, praise. Um, I didn't. I I less needed the validation from other people, even though it would have been nice to have been recognized. Um, and this other thing is showing up that is actually something that's been a really important thing that I've had to overcome in my life, but related to invisibility is just sort of this core experience of not really feeling that important. You know, oh, I'm getting tearful. <laughs> mm, I am too. I'm noticing that there's a lot of tenderness here. Yeah. Just that, that's something, I think that might be a core wound of mine, you know, dating way back into childhood. 
um, and also related to this idea of like, I don't want to do proving grounds anymore. That's really shitty. You know, it's terrible to have to try to prove to other people my own importance. And I really wanted to stop playing that game when I left Outward Bound and then went into graduate school. Um, so yeah, that was a coping mechanism, but there was a lot underneath that that I really needed to go through in order to get to this place of unshakable faith in myself. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like there was that, that wound around, you know, not knowing if you were important and feeling invisible and you just, you had to be done with it. And the way that you helped yourself do that, which was to have the unshakable faith in yourself. And I'm like, how did, how did that happen? You know, where did you learn how to cultivate unshakable faith in yourself? If you didn't have that before, was it a switch that happened? Was it reflections from others, connection to nature? I mean, it could be anything. Right. I mean, I think it was probably different things at different times, but what occurs to me as you ask, um, so I, I grew up in a house where my parents were pretty deeply misattuned to my emotional needs. They were really good about meeting my physical needs, like school and you know sort of having enough money and that kind of thing um but sorry i just spaced out what was the question again mm. just how does that happen does a switch flip and uh, uh or, you know and you said it was a lot of different things and your parents were quite misattuned yeah okay so to be even more explicit my parents were um physically abusive and the way that my system responded to that was to fight. So we know about fight, flight, freeze, right, as the, as the uh, defense mechanisms. And my response was always to fight back, just every single time. You know, growing up, I had really contentious relationships with my parents, and they're old school Filipinos. So talking back is not a thing that you do. Obeying is the thing that you do. Um, and if you really knew me, <laughs> you would know that obeying is, I'm not, I'm not that wired for <laughs> that. Um, and so I was just always a fighter. And somehow at a young age, I just was like, yeah, I'm going to get through this. I'm eventually going to get out of this house, living with my parents. And when I do, it's going to be epic. You know, when I left college, so I was already out of the house, but I left college. And that's when I got my first job with Outward Bound in Colorado. And that was when I was 21 or 22. Um, but it came from that, like my map for how I needed to take care of myself was to always fight back. And um, I did a lot of fighting. I spent a lot of time being angry in my life and blaming my parents for years and years about the state of my life and all kinds of things. But that was sort of the most earliest, to answer your question, the earliest thing that taught me like, right, if you fight hard enough, you're going to get somewhere, even if it's just moving out of your parents' house, even if it's whatever it was that was going to be. And while my fight response um, also got me into a lot of trouble and I lost a lot of relationships and is very destructive, the upside of that is that it's gotten me here. Mm. Um, funny little thing. So when you sent me, I... I read, I was looking for my bios when you asked me to send me my bio. And so I found four documents and one of them was like an about page that I had written. And it, it's the whole point of it. The opening line was something like, I really fought my way to be here. Wow. And I'm getting tearful again. Wow. Yeah. Cause I have, I've really fought to get to this life. That is amazing. My life is so amazing. <laughs> And I have had to work really hard and fight really hard for all the things that I have ever gotten to participate in or achieve. It just didn't, nothing was handed to me. Um, mm. Yeah. Wow. I'm really appreciating the health in your system. You know, even <laughs> though, <laughs> totally. yeah, even though there was a, you know, a response, a traumatic response to what was happening, that yeah. response had a lot of wisdom in it. It really did. So much wisdom. Holy, that's a beautiful way of saying that, that, that response from the misattunement and the abuse has so much wisdom. Um, and as fellow therapists, I'm sure that, you know, we both know, like, 
that's part of what we need to help our clients do is find the wisdom in however it is that they're acting so that they can understand it's actually a brilliant survival mechanism, but maybe not one that works for them so much anymore these days. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And how beautiful that it got you to a place like you had to fight to be unshakable. You had that. I keep seeing it as a light in you to not to be too cliche, <laughs> but something yes. that kept going that was already living in you that you was already part of you and who you are yeah. that got you to that unshakableness, to that revolutionary love where you could walk it out the door on your first date and just be so <laughs> full of yourself and revolutionary love totally. in such a beautiful way. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was, it was my path. It's certainly not everybody's path, but I certainly have a lot more gratitude for, you know, my parents and the ways that they just didn't know. Like they really just didn't know. And they just also didn't have the capacity to meet my needs in the way that I really needed them to meet. And so the upside again is that I figured out a way how to do that and then continued to keep doing it. Um, and in my own healing path, don't have to fight anymore. Like I don't need my anger to show up all the freaking time or to, I don't know, worry that people are judging me or however that tended to show up. I, I can't totally remember in this moment, but yeah, it's a, that felt like a really important piece in my story at one point is to be able to talk about how much I've had to fight. Cause I think fighting gets a bad name, but it's what I needed to get to where I'm at right now. And I wouldn't change any of it. Oh, I love that. And it sounds like what came on the other side of that fight was you learning how to attune to yourself. Yes. To actually create a container and holding when you were having anything come up, no matter what, where yeah. now you can allow yourself to just be as you are with yes. so much care and love. Yeah, that's a really good um, get. It feels good to, it feels really good to hear you having caught that because I think that's all true. It totally resonates. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Huh, my heart is just doing all sorts of things as you're <laughs> so sharing. So is mine. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to take a breath because, I mean, you really have gone through so much. And yeah. to hear you say that your your life is amazing and wonderful. Oh, and amazing. I see you light up. And I've heard you tell me just a little about your life. And it is really inspiring. Yeah. What you've worked yeah. for. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm feeling a lot of, I'm noticing a lot of gratitude happen because, you know, of course I have my close friends that I can speak to but it's kind of rare to have someone actually ask me about my story. You know, clients, their focus is on them, of course. And I, I think that's something that's really important for people to be able to do is to talk about where they've been and where they are now and the pro like everything in between that feels really meaningful. Um, Cause I haven't talked about this story in at least a few years, if not longer. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm appreciating that you're, asking about like how'd you get to this unshakable faith because it wasn't overnight it wasn't like I woke up and I was like I am the jam you know it was like a progression of ups and downs and falling into pits and feeling totally worthless and insecure to like you know being on top of the world and feeling mighty and empowered um so yeah thank you for asking it's it's a lovely question to be able to share mm. to answer yeah you're so welcome and I hear you bringing in your clients and I'm just curious, how has all of this healing and growth uh, impacted the work you do with your clients and in the world? Well, you know, so we met just recently at the Somatic Resilience and Regulation Training and I started taking that, I did that training for the first time probably three years ago. And um, I think, one of the things that most surprised me, and I may have told you this, was being surprised at seeing myself in the conversation that Kathy and Steve were having about developmental trauma and not knowing that I had it, you know, that I had early abuse and neglect that had totally patterned my nervous system and sort of, you know, quote unquote, forced me to respond to certain things almost always the same way, which for me was like anger and like 
act, you know, not acting out, but kind of acting out, um, being kind of aggressive or being very aggressive. Um, so with my clients and this training, one of the beautiful things about this training is that um, with the co-regulating touch work and that experience, the best way I can describe it now, three years later, is um, helping map my nervous system to have a more of a we space, like me and you together are in this conversation right now, and there's like an easeful back and forth, and I feel safe with you, and it feels very um, easy to talk about. That's just not something that I had. And because I have that early map of neglect and abuse, I think it actually predisposes me to be even more attuned, present, compassionate in ways that people really get to feel held without any demand to be any other way than they are. And, you know, I credit my own, of course, I credit myself for all the work that I've done. And this training just sort of all the, all the work I've done before was sort of the foundation. And then I did this training. And in, this, in those three years since I did that training, the quantum leaps in my growth have been literally nothing short of fucking miraculous. Hmm. Like I sometimes I'm like, wow, Myra, you are in a different place. You feel different. You're acting different. You know, clients are doing tremendous work because they have that strong, safe container. Um, and as you said, um, right at the beginning when you were talking about being with me and feeling safe, you know, and that's not a word that you use lightly. That's pretty much everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, is having, at least in my world, an embodied sense of safety. So then you can, people can launch from that place and take really big risks in life, whether it's proposing marriage to someone or starting a new business or simply just saying no to a request. Um, and so I think that my clients gain the benefit, as weird as this sounds, of what happened for me earlier. You know, it's become a superpower that's a whole superpower over time of like being able to know how to really be with clients in just the right way for them. Um, and I'm sure you've experienced this in your own growth, but that's really powerful. That heals so much. Yeah. Yeah. The embodied sense of safety. Whew, it truly is everything. And I can resonate. 100% with what totally. you're saying. The more my system gets regulated, the easier it is to do my work and the, the deeper the shifts are that are happening with my clients. <laughs> exactly right. Like right, safety and regulation are everything. They are, they are everything as far as I can tell. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Mm. <laughs> Coming from two somatic psychotherapists. Right, totally. And, you know, I also... I just love talking about this stuff, you know, like it's what I want to talk to. It's where my attention goes. It's what I want to talk to with colleagues, with clients, like, Hey, here's a little known secret that nobody in psychology or not a lot of people in psychology talk about, which is like what embodiment is, what regulation is. And like, how do you get that embodied sense of safety? That's epic shit right there. Yeah. <laughs> it really is everything. Yeah. <laughs> right. Totally. It is, and there are words that are hard to describe and hard to break down and hard to advertise, but it's cutting edge. And truly, it has been for 30 years, but it's getting more and more popular. That's true. And the reason why I'm doing the podcast the way I am is because really I think the best way to convey it is through our stories, through what we've been through and how we've come into regulation and resilience and love. I agree. I, you know, I sent you that text earlier about, because I think that this podcast, just to toot your horn for a little bit, is so brilliant because I think often from the seat of being a client, looking at a therapist that, you know, is delightful or happy or feel, you know, I think clients can make up a lot of stories about us, but my clients are, are pretty consistently saying things like, just really lovely things, really nice things about me. And I think that they have this thing where it's like, this is just how I am versus <laughs> like, oh, no, girl, <laughs> I work this shit out. And so the fact that you have created a podcast to bring healers online to talk about their process is so brilliant because I just don't think there's enough transparency 
in the world with therapists and definitely not in the clinical space where you're working with clients um, because of all the taboos about boundaries and all the stuff that we're taught in graduate school about, you know, being a really good therapist. I think that's at least half of what really helps my clients heal is that they have some pieces of my story that are always in service of them. So yes. this service through your podcast is so needed. I mean, I sent you that text as soon as I read through what you were creating. And I was like, oh my God, fuck yes, sign me up, <laughs> right? So thank you for bringing this because I think, I think clinicians are scared to be real about who they are to the wider public and especially with their clients. And mm -hmm. our stories are what helps other people heal, just like other people telling stories helps them heal. Yeah, yeah, so, especially, and I think you'll agree with this, when we share our stories from an integrated, regulated way. That's right. We're not traumatizing others by speaking about the hardships and challenges we've had. We're actually saying them in a way that people can hear and it can land and it's not overwhelming them. Yeah. I mean, we had a conversation about that. And I don't know if you remember, but I was like so vehemently agree in agreement with you. Because I think one of the hard parts about trauma is that people want to tell the nitty gritty details about exactly what happened. And while I get that and there's space for that, it isn't always helpful, right? It's, it, it relit, the body relives that when you tell that story. And so I was even watching myself as I was talking, like, yeah, my parent, there was early neglect and abuse. I could tell you a thousand stories about some very specific things and because I'm integrated, because I'm regulated, it's like, yeah, I could do that, but this is enough. This is plenty. Mm -hmm. And I'm also not as interested in focusing all of my attention into those details. Mm -hmm. um, does that make sense? Absolutely. And I love that you said I was watching myself share the story because <laughs> that is the key to healing, to integration, and to staying balanced while we share our story, to have this online part of ourselves that is observing and making sure we're sharing just enough so that we're not overwhelming ourselves. <laughs> totally. Yeah. We have to have that strong observer self as the, as the beginning point so that we can do this work in a way so that we don't keep getting re-traumatized. Yeah. Thank you for modeling that so beautifully. You're welcome. Thank yeah. you for noticing. Yeah. I'm wondering if you have any uh, practices that you'd like to guide us through or words of wisdom that you'd like to share, maybe something you share with your clients that can help either practitioners or clinicians feel more resourced or just anybody who's struggling move towards yeah. revolutionary love and resilience. Yeah, I'd love to. This is actually a somatic experiencing thing that I got from training and it made such um, such an impression on me that I use it all the time and it has really changed my outlook on life. But um, the practice is, is noticing the good, right? So, um, wow, what a beautiful sunset. And then typically when people notice the good, it's like, oh, that's nice. And then they move right on, right? And especially with trauma, joy tends to go away. So the practice would be not just noticing, so here's what it would be like when I tell clients. So what I want you to do is I want you at the end of the day, I want you to journal about the best parts of your day. The lovely meal that you ate, the little five minute cuddle session you had with your puppy. I don't care what it is. These don't have to be massive things. It could be very simple things like warm feet after shoveling snow, <laughs> right? Um, and then after you write that down, I want you to go ahead and relive the experience in your mind. And then send your attention south into your body. And I want you to write down and notice all of the things that are beginning to shift as a result of lingering your attention in that good feeling lived experience. So you would write down things like, ah, like I just did, like, oh, I noticed that my body took a natural sigh and my shoulders dropped away from my ears and suddenly the room got brighter, like whatever it is, but from the body-based place, right? And do that every day. Do it every day as often as you can and watch what begins to happen to your outlook and your physiology. I just love that practice more than anything. It seems so ridiculously simple. <laughs> and know, right? <laughs> it is revolutionary. Yeah, I think so too. 
as you described the sensations that you were noticing, my whole body just had goosebumps. Totally. Exactly. Yeah. We just don't, we just don't spend enough time in daily life focusing on what feels good. It's, it's just a, it's just a common thing. You know, I ride up in the elevator to work and people are like, how are you? Or, you know, chit chat. And it's always inevitably something like, oh, you know, same old, same old, or like, yeah, tired as usual. And it's like, oh, dang, that must be really hard to live if you're always focusing on what's wrong versus what's going right or what feels good. So, yeah, yeah I love that. It's such an important practice. And yeah. you're right. A lot of folks with trauma get really focused on what doesn't feel good. And That's so true. this is this, something we can all do that is hopefully not too overwhelming, likely not. Yeah, that, hopefully not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can start really putting in our life in these little tiny moments. And it's yes. huge. Oh, I love how you said that. Start putting our life in, in these little tiny moments. Yes, exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, I love this conversation. I cannot wait for everything we're going to do together. I know, yeah. me too. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I just want to see, are you seeing clients in Denver? Do you see clients online? You know, how, so if people are just really loving connecting with you right now, how can they find you and what does it look like to be working with you? Yeah. So I mainly see clients in my office, um, because I focus primarily on treating developmental trauma through the use of co-regulating touch. Um, and as you, we talked about, I'm going to be expanding my practice and at least one of my practitioners is going to be trained in co-regulating touch. So if you can't work with me, you can work with one of my other two associates. Um, I do do online work. I really love doing it. I just don't do it that often. So when clients move away, typically they want to keep seeing me through, you know, online. Um, so right now people can find me on my website, uh, myraholtzman.com. Um, I think you'll have a link somewhere probably. Yeah. Um, and then my website, my new website will be launching hopefully by Christmas and it's called um, somatictherapypartners.com. Um, there'll be some videos up of me and, you know, they can get to know me better. Um, so even if they can't work with me, they can work with somebody else. But um, yeah, I can, I can do all the ways of working together. Mm, okay. Well, yeah. people I know will be coming to find you and I'm really <laughs> excited for this new project that you have going. And Thank you. Um, I'm going to just send you all the love and support I can because it's huge and it's needed and it's a big deal. And I'm just honored by your bravery to launch that. Mm. Thank you, Shelby. It's been so awesome being here with you. I'm, I'm, I just can't reiterate again. Like I look forward to all the things that we're going to do together, create together, play, all the things. It's going to be wonderful. Yeah, me too. Thank you <laughs> so much. Let's just take a breath and then we'll end. Okay. Thank you so much for being part of this show and being part of this love revolution. If you love this podcast, please share it with your people and leave a five-star review so that we can get the word out. If you're a practitioner or on your own healing journey, head on over and check out creatingsaferspace.com which is one of my passion projects and is open for enrollment now. You'll get access to it the moment you sign up or join my mailing list for all sorts of revolutionary love and trauma-aware support at shelby-lee.com. See you next episode.